God, magnificent Creator, forgiving Father, loving Savior, Jesus the Christ, Holy Spirit that is amongst us. We pray that in the moments ahead, words might be said that are proclaimed about the goodness of your love, the healing that you want to give us, and Lord, the peace that will prevail when we are with you, together with you, in heaven. Till that day, Lord, we pray for strength and peace that we might have steadfastness walking in your way. Now, Lord, we thank you for all of those that have faithfully been in the gap, have stood there and have uh, taken care of COVID and all these other diseases, Father. We know that the illness didn't just stop when COVID came, but Lord, uh, it made things worse. Now, Father, we pray for our country. And God, we pray that we might be a people that are a people of God. Lord, that we might be a people that knows that all good and perfect gifts come from you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you forgive me of my sins. Father, I pray for the forgiveness of the sins of my family. Lord, I pray for the forgiveness of sins of those that attend this church. Father, for the sins of those in Morgantown and those in Kentucky. Lord, I pray for the whole United States that they might be forgiven. And all those that Jesus died for around the world, may their sins be forgiven. Lord, may they seek you and come close to you and reach out and touch you. Lord, that your healing might be provided. Lord, thank you that we can come and worship in this place. Lord, thank you for all these that are able to return here to gather and worship. And Lord, be with those that can't be but want to. Father, there are those outside of these walls that don't want to yet. And Father, I pray that you might put our circumstances across their path, that we might be like that Samaritan, that we might help lift them out of the ditch, bind up their wounds, and care for them. We pray all these things for leaving, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, can you imagine? Now, what does it say? She had suffered for 12 years. Now, I'm not going to pick on Sally, but she's had a sore on her leg for several days. I suspect if you ask her, she can tell you almost how many days it's been. And she knows she's got more suffering ahead. But 12 years? 12 years of good? Oh, how horrible that must have been. For those of you that are here, that have little girls in your family, uh, I know we think of them. I've got two, and they're both special to me. My son's special to me, but, but there's something about a little girl that has a daddy's heart. And if it's the only child that the daddy has, it's, it's especially uh, something. And you think. Now, <clears throat> folks, it doesn't say, this lady, it doesn't say how she had been. Had she been to the synagogue? Had she been to the temple? Had she been to the hairdresser? I don't know. It doesn't say where she had been, but she had been somewhere to hear about Jesus. Somebody outside these walls, are we telling the story of Jesus enough that somebody might hear and come unto him? Now we look at the synagogue ruler, okay? And the synagogue ruler might be the head elder, 
okay, of a place. A synagogue had to have ten families. Right, Rusty, if I got that right, is it ten or six? They had to have several families. You couldn't just have a synagogue because you wanted to build one. And the synagogue accumulated scripture there. They didn't have everything that the temple had, but it was a local place to come and worship on the Sabbath. And people gathered there. And I'm sure this little 12-year-old girl had grown up in the synagogue. They had seen her running around. They had all seen that. By the way, what do you think about them folks out there wailing and screaming? Do you know about the culture back then? They didn't send flowers. No. They had wailers, literally. They had folks that were friends and neighbors that would come and loudly lament in the open. And if it was a wealthy family, they didn't hire some professional waiters to come in. Those that could really shed those big crocodile tears and, and yell loudly. Now, if you don't believe me, you go back and read and go Google it. And that, that is true. There were several that were there. Now, this is one of the parts of the gospel that I've always found interesting is when Jesus goes in a small group, there's always three that are there. Now, the brothers, he had nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Can't you imagine why he nicknamed them that? Why, they would like to fire up, fire off and, and just really get angry at something. But he had them close to him. And who was the other? Simon Peter. And he was with him. We know about Peter. He, he, uh, he realized how much he had not honored Christ before Christ died. And when he, after Christ was resurrected and he went about doing good and ministering for the Lord, when it came his time to die, he insisted on being crucified upside down. Because he said he, there was no way that he could be honored in death the same way that his master was. Do you think they told the story? Do you think they were in places to where they were allowed to tell the story? I think so. And if we follow along, if we were to go into the book of Acts and we follow along in the early church, we find where they are confronted and they say, they told to shut up about Jesus. And they say, we can't help but tell the story of what we've seen and heard. We can't help but tell the story. Where are we today, folks? Where are we today in this world? Well, we're more liable to tell about the politician that made this big brag or another politician that says he was just absolutely... Uh, Things were done against him, and, and uh, the election was stolen from him. Maybe we might hear about uh, a bunch of people getting killed. Have you talked about the condominium down in Miami that collapsed? Mike, you at the restaurant. How many people were talking about that? Several. They were. They were. And, I, and I'm not going to put ask you, but I dare say there wasn't many that were telling about what Jesus had done for them that week. <clears throat> we got things upside down. What has Jesus done for you this week? Has he stilled your spirit? Has he encouraged you about things that are going on? Has he come to find you? Now, I want you to look. And we're going back up just a little bit. First of all, let's look at the story of 2 Samuel. Jonathan and David. Now, <clears throat> those perverts uh, that are sexual deviants uh, want to take and make this a story 
about homosexual love. And that is exactly not what this is. This is about friendship love. That kind of love between two people. And this is about men. I dare say women have this close love with a close friend. Somebody that is closer than a brother or a sister. Somebody that you have shared your inmost thoughts, all of the things that you've done. But look at David. He is talking about Jonathan and Saul. Jonathan and Saul. Well, Saul had done lots of things for David when David was doing lots of things for him. But he got afraid that David was going to take the kingdom. And uh, he wound up taking the kingdom, but it was because of Saul's sin, not because that David was victorious. Saul put himself in the place of God, and he decided that he needed to sacrifice and could not wait for the prophet and priest to get there, Samuel. And he did it himself. And he was wrong. But look there at, at, at David talking about them. Now, when you have a gap, okay, that's where the action is going to happen. When there's a narrow place and it's come together, that's where there's either going to be an ambush or, or just an all-out battle. And, you know, you think of, of kings and stuff, and generals, they're behind. Okay? They're behind. Maybe. Not Jonathan and Saul. They knew it was going to be rough. They were there fighting in the gap, putting their life on the line, knowing that they could die. And they wound up dying. Okay? But David loved Jonathan because of his truthfulness and his integrity. Jonathan told David the truth even when he was telling him that his father was trying to kill him. That old Saul was trying to kill David. And still, David loved him. He didn't worry about Jonathan stabbing him in the back. He didn't worry about him telling his daddy where he could be found, where he could be killed. No, they were faithful friends to the end. Oh, I pray that we have friends like that in our life. And if we don't, I pray that we might find them. But the thing about it is, is David honored them. You don't see David here talking about his sins. By the way, this is just an aside, but it is a good point. I've never read in the Bible anywhere where you're supposed to confess your brother's sins for him or your sister's. We are supposed to confess our sins to one another, but it's not about us conf confessing somebody else's sin. You look... At the, and I believe it was David that wrote this 30th Psalm. And he is talking about the faithfulness and the goodness of God. I was sick and you healed me. I was in the pit and you plucked me out. He knew what it meant to worship God. David the man that was after God's own heart had enough guts to get in God's face. If you don't believe it, look there. All right. In verse 9, what is gained if I am silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Folks, he was saying, God, if you kill me, what good am I going to be to you? We can, God will honor us if we stand up and ask Him to do something that we think is right for us. If we're righteous, He is going to answer us. But we need to be like David. He goes on. He says a faithful prayer in verse 10. Hear, O Lord, and be merciful.
merciful to me, Lord, to be my help. He is saying that he knows that God's going to come through and he is praising him for it. At the end there, Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Why? Because God is faithful forever to all of us. We can we could go through all of this scripture and, and the lamentations. Oh my. Those people had suffered so much, but they were declaring in faith that something good was going to happen. This part of Lamentations was written uh, right after uh, old Nebuchadnezzar had come down from Babylon, 600 miles. He didn't come for the trip for nothing. He robbed the temple of everything it had. He took every beautiful woman and every handsome man and every smart person that was there and took them back home because he was going to uh, inculcate them into Babylonian culture. Folks, we have got to stand for God in our uh, culture. It says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. We need to go to God's Word. And if we go to God's Word and study it, we will find that the type of government we have here, the democracy and all of that, was established because of the church. And the government wants to outlaw the church. And that's not what the founders of the Constitution said. The Second Amendment said, uh, there shall be no state religion or uh, forbidding the free exercise thereof. Now that's a paraphrase. That's not exactly how it is. But what they were getting at is you can't tax people to keep the church open. See, people, if the offer plate went by and they didn't put in it, back then they just taxed them. They had to pay the taxes. We need to proclaim Jesus. We need to proclaim His love and His mercy and His grace. But folks, we also have to proclaim that if they turn their back on them, there is righteous judgment. What was it? Uh, it says over in Hebrews, I believe, it's awful to fall into the hands of an angry God. Jonathan Edwards preached that at the beginning of the Great Awakening up in the Northeast 300 and some odd plus years ago. It is awful to fall in the hands of an angry God. But it is good, it is good to believe that God is so good that if I just reach up there and touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Brother Rusty Pettigrew, will you close us in prayer and that will be our dismissal. <clears throat> Our Father, we thank you again for this time of worship and refreshment. We thank you for your word. Yes, Lord. It guides us and draws us ever closer to your unfolding truth for our lives. Yes, God. Oh again, as we go from this place, we pray that we would go empowered by your spirit. Thank you again for this moment. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen.